Hey, I'm a geotechnical engineer with Weather Engineering, uh, and I'm going to be your host tonight. Uh, a big thank you to all the sponsors of the Queensland Tennis Group, uh, Axter, IGS, Radar, KCB, ATC, Comtech, Solmax, Hexagon, Macquarie Geotech, uh, are our platinum sponsors. Our gold sponsor is SLR. Um, we have three presenters tonight uh, to discuss the topic of numerical modeling in uh, tennis dam engineering. Uh, we have Dr. Arenas, Dr. Lee, and Dr. Karmaja. Uh, we're going to kick off the session with Dr. Arenas' presentation. Dr. Arenas is a civil engineer with more than 23 years of experience in geotechnical engineering. He has the important geotechnical and structural designs such as concrete face rock dams, mechanically stabilized earth walls, waste dumps, and tailored storage facilities. <coughs> Additionally, he has assessed slope stability and liquefaction potential for a multitude of projects. He has conducted seismic hazard analysis, including a spectral matching of real seismic events, and has conducted several dam bridge analyses. He has been the leader for numerical modeling in the civil and mining sectors, having developed his role in South America and Australia. He has led a multitude of analysis using FLAC and FLAC 3D, modeling static and dynamic conditions. He has assessed uh, liquefaction potential and cyclic action <coughs> using advanced constitutive models. He has been a leader in developing methodologies for delivering numerical in a reasonable short time and at a reasonable reasonably low cost. Uh, finally, he has developed a standalone software for processing high efficiency measures for FLAC and FLAC 3D within a few hours. He has worked for different client sectors, including numerical analysis for NASA, forensic analysis of civil structures and investigation, governmental institutions, and important money projects. Um, please welcome Dr. Arnold. If I need to speak up, do this. <coughs> All right. <coughs> so thank you for that introduction, Marcelo. Um, I'm going to be presenting two cases today. I know the time is limited, but I really want to cover a lot of ground here. One of the cases I'm going to be presenting is the NASA Crowd Transportability Assessment. That's one of the biggest projects I've been involved in. Uh, it lasts for a span time of 10 years, but effectively we work two and a half years, so there's a lot of reasons why we still put in political reasons, for example, Obama put the trigger, the, the plaque out of the, the space program, so things like that, even that you're being touched by things like that. And then I'm going to, since it's a stable group, um, I'm going to be talking about a TSF analysis we did recently in, here in, in, in WA. So, at the close show, I'm going to just give my thoughts, my opinion, I mean, during my over 18 years of being modeling. My first flat key was a parallel port. I don't know if you remember that, the, the very big one. But that's, that's how I started, like, with version 2.1, I believe, in the flat. So, many years ago. Uh, but throughout these 18 years, out of the 23, I, I've been learning stuff. I've been uh, in both sides of the table, like as a consultant, also as a client. So, in, in review panels, and I'm going to give you my view of where we are and where we're heading. So, this project was awarded the Project of the Year in, in 2011 by the ACE. Uh, it's a very important project, I'm really proud of being part of this. I work with people like Schmerman, if you know the foundation guy, that kind of guy was involved in this project. So, NASA approached my advisor, and he, he was asked, uh, can we move the crowd transport faster? That was a simple question, and it was really uh, an answer that took about 10 years to answer. So the thing is, this is the crowded transporter. In this case, it's carrying the Challenger with the auxiliary rockets. That is, the, the, the rocket is assembled over the crawler in the assembly building, which is nine miles away from the launching pad that is seen at the back. So the crawler moves in average at about 0.1 miles per hour. So nine miles is covered in 90 hours. So for NASA, that was a big spend of money because each corner of the crowd is controlled by a team. So they need to reduce that. So they pretty much ask, can we move it three, five, three times faster, like a 0.3 miles per hour? Uh, and also, they say, at that time, we're going to go to a new space program, which is going to go more road. So 
another picture of the crawler, um, here you can see it's, it's a very big structure. So a person standing would be this height. Roughly, you can see a truck in the back. It's, it's a little bit far, but probably a person like a 1.8 meters person would be standing here. So each corner has this cabin when it's like a four or five people controlling the, all the crawlers, the speed, inclination, all this stuff. So in 2008, when my professor was approached, my advisor was approached by NASA, that's today, 2008. So they were carrying this crawler with a rocket on top of it, and it was weighted 18 million pounds. Uh, everything is in pounds, inches, and everything like that, so everything for the presentation. So they say in the future, in 2010, we're going to do RS-1, which is going to be a little less than 18 million pounds, but in the future, we're going to RS-5, which is going to be 25 million pounds. A little bit of background uh, on the foundation, so it's still with a lime rock, compacted lime rock, but underneath that is a hydraulic deposit. So in 1967, Peck, Ralph Peck, did a lot of SPT, and you can see it's, it's a little bit blurry, but you can see a lot of zeros here. You can see everywhere the place is surrounded, there's a lot of zeros. So the, the hydraulic field, it was very, very loose. So what it means a, a loose layer? Once you move the chrome layer, it's going to generate excess for pressure. And as we know, excess for pressure is proportional to um, the rate of load and the magnitude of the load. So uh, I'm going to skip this one. I think this is another one. one. First, this is the first one we, we did um, initially. So back in 2008, we Ralph Beck, into, sorry, we used the information that Ralph Beck developed at that time. <coughs> and this is this is the surface, and this is the with the sort of contracted layer. So if you take a look to the front track, as approach to a piezometer at this depth, this is the distance, right? It's going to increase the exit pressure measured by the piezometer. So the closer the, the track, the front track, is going to create an up curve, and then if you stop, it's going to dissipate. So basically, that's what Ralph Beck measured at the field in 1967. So at zero is my piezometer, and as the crawler is approaching to the, the, <coughs> the piezometer, the exit pressure is increasing. This is uh, in PSI, so they stopped the crawler at 20 feet, because at that time they thought it was safe not going beyond 10 PSI. So the initial work was just a simple numerical model in 3D still. So we basically we did the geotechnical profile, we back analysis the um, permeabilities, and we can com compute the, the red line. So we, we have the build up, and it was a proof of concept. At that time, NASA couldn't believe we can really reproduce this, but it was one single point with a rough pick data, and it, the build up it was pretty much captured, but then the dissipation was a little bit uh, lower in the numerical model. So, now I'm going to go back because it was rough. Um, so fast forward to Jan, uh, January 2020. Uh, NASA let us play with the crawler transporter. And as you can see, they didn't let us play with the rocket, but instead we simulated a lot of the rocket with concrete blocks. So they loaded and passed the, this instrumental section many times. Like, uh, it was passed uh, with different loads going anywhere from 12 million pounds to 25, even 30 million pounds. And we did different distribution, and this heavily instrumental section has piezometer, inclinometer, uh, you name it, basically it has everything. So, but the most important instrument was the piezometer. It was distributed uh, along the center line of two tracks. So there was a different depth, but also off of the tracks. So this is how, it's one of, this is 0.3 miles per hour. Actually, this is moving. You will, you will see the tracks are moving. This is how, they, how fast they want to move it. So this is the ideal target for NASA, actually. So imagine this, like a 18 million, 25 million pounds moving at this speed. So it, it requires a lot of effort, actually. So, so, um, so basically, in January 2020, we have a lot of more information, the inclinometer, settlement, plates, everything. <coughs> so instead of now approaching to the piezometer, the crawler was passing the piezometer. So basically, when the first track is approaching, you're going to see a peak. And then when it's coming to the middle point, it's going to be a valley. And then a second peak when the second track is on top of the piezometer. So now we need a numerical model for this. You know, with a big team of people, a lot of geotechnical engineers, we came up with a profile, and then we back analysis the, the permeabilities, horizontal and vertical. That was uh, one of the exercises you do. Sometimes you can calibrate uh, the constitutive level model, like a one element. Sometimes you have to calibrate like a, a boundary condition from it like this. So this is the in, the, in the left hand, you will see the, the stress. So here I'm modeling just half of a quarter, actually, of the crawler, let me see. So it's basically I'm modeling this part here. 
just two tracks. But given the, the sorry, and I said that wrong. I'm not only half of the crawler, but you will see just half of it. So now the video is, is showing how the in, on the surface the movement is loading, and you can see how the excess propulsion is building up. This is one of the type of couple models where you have the bio tier theory. It's not the same as the shearing. Like I would say, you're looking at triaxial test, and the shearing is going to produce extra pressure. Now, this is the case where the, the isotropic is, uh, confinement is going to produce uh, you know, extra pressure. So it's more like a consolidation part of for your triaxial test, if you will. So, but then, it's not, uh, this is a couple. So it, it was a silty sand, this material. So it's not like a fully undrained or fully drained. So it's some, something in between. You, you saw the, the um, initially the um, the dissipation test, it only takes five minutes to dissipate 10 psi. So it's really like a, in those areas, like a 10 to the minus 4 centimeters per second. So uh, the gray lines now are the field measurements, and the orange or red lines are the flat model. So here's one track, will be one track standing here, the other track will be standing here, and this will be the symmetric plane. And the other side will have the same. So I'm looking right from the, the crawler transporter. So, as you can see, uh, once the model was calibrated, it was able not only to pick up the, the, um, the peaks, also the valley. So, you can see the upper plot, and this plot, and this plot correspond exactly to the circle. So, this is in between the tracks, and this is the offset of the tracks. So, once the model is calibrated, and if you understand really well how the, the couple theory works, you can come up with a solution. That it actually we were really nice, nicely surprised to have not only the peaks and the valleys, but also the shape. You can see that the peaks and the valleys, the difference is much smaller than when, when it's right underneath the track and closer to the surface. So, another uh, four points here. You can see again, we were calibrating, and the response is very much in the, the shape of what was measured in the field. So, some of the, them are smaller in the field, some of them are higher. We just pick the, the, uh, the higher response of the field. So after, as I said, many years of working on this, um, we came up with this plot. This is all that NASA needed at the end of the day. So you can see here the million pounds, 18 to 25.5 million pounds, and this is the speed of the crowd transporter. So now NASA works with reliabilities that are way beyond the, what we see in engineering, geotechnical engineering. But this is the type of things that they needed, and they, they actually dig a number from here, which is uh, not transfer to us, but they, they say like we're going to use this information and we're actually going to move the, the college of forest faster. So the previous result from flag 3D was coupled with a series of like a stability analysis result where the exit proportion were exported from the, that analysis and we, we tried different things like a strength reduction factor, limit equilibrium and stuff like that. <coughs> and we had the uh, standard limit equilibrium was limited for this type of, of analysis. But this each part of this one is a, a super complex analysis and a lot of calibration. So. This is um, the first ray I'm going to present. And the second one is since the stalings, uh, we're going to present a TSF that is upstream rays. We recently completed this like a, a pretty much a, um, a year and a half ago. So um, what we have here is the in yellow is the started down, and then there's tailing the position inside. And this is the upstream rays. Uh, we have two types of stalings. One is called the sun-like, so it's primary tailings called. The oxide tailings, which is clay-like. And there is in between, like it's changing interbedded, so it's changing from sunlight to clay light. So, and this is a specific location. Uh, this was done in 2D and 3D. I'm just presenting the 2D um, uh, model here. In this specific location, this light represents the negative minus 0 0.05 state parameter. So all this is the state parameter, and the light basically is separate what is dilated from contracting. So if you just screen the, the presentation, you will see there's a lot of contracting materials here. Especially uh, at this back step, there was a massive contracting material. You cannot see the presentation, but this is going to state parameters about 0.22. So it's quite contracting material. So for this specific project, we did, I developed uh, an um, interpolation scheme that is uh, especially the, the, for tailings. Uh, so there is a lot of information, and actually, with the we're going to present a paper on this. Um, but one of the advantages you have this, that whoever has used before the CPTU spreadsheet, you have to assume a K0 condition, right? You, you assume, say, usually, like Mike Jeffries or anyone, you will say that's 0.7. 
Uh, the advantage of interpolating this in, within the environment, the numerical environment, in my case, flag, you don't have to assume the k not condition. And as we know, k not condition changes from whatever we assume, say, by Poisson, to when you approach the slope to close to 1. So, and you know, you, you have to do uh, that because you want to compute the Q key. So, what we did in this case, we just take this and with the special scheme we developed, we interpolated the state parameters. So now, each element in the, in the model has a different <coughs> So, this is our refinement from what we do usually in the limited equilibrium, where you do, for example, some statistical analysis and you take a percentile 20 or something like that. So, in this case, we're taking advantage of the tool and we're just actually interpolating everything. So these are the equations that are developed by Plus and by Jeffries, and we just came up with this. So you can see the, what I just showed you before, oh, sorry, this one here, this and this are very well captured here. We have these tailings that are very contracted. So in order to do this, uh, we did a dynamic analysis for this, and we calibrated uh, one of the constant models that is built in flag 3 d It's called P2P SAN, and the beauty of of what we learned this, when I started this, this model for quite a long time, about six months before trying to use it. Uh, so we were waiting for a project like this. And the beauty, in my opinion, uh, I'm really fan of having one set of properties for untrained, untrained, and for covering the entire range of stresses. I'm really a fan of that. I mean, in my experience, sometimes people try to do um, a parameter that's dependent state for P prime or, or something like that, like it changes. But uh, when you extrapolate things, um, it's really dangerous because in triaction we we really know the stress path, right? We know the stress path is going this or that or strain, whatever. But when you put input a seismic signal at the bottom, the stress path can be anything. So extrapolating those parameters with something that's dependent on some unknown that you haven't tested in the range is very dangerous. So in my opinion, I really like having one set of properties for drain and undrain. And I think we, we made it really nice here. The blue lines are the lab testing, and the green lines are the one element model to the cost of this level. So you can see it more contractive, but there's also the orange heat one that is uh, the flag, and the red one is the testing. So we can actually capture, this is a K-node test, this one here. Um, we can actually capture very contractive material, and very uh, also dense material. And also in the void ratio, P space, you can see it, uh, uh, it's reflected. When it's on drain, it's a little bit, you can see my line drops faster because it's more contracted in the drain space. You can see it in both the space, so it's very consistent. So we spent quite a lot of time learning this, and I think it paid off. So what I'm going to show you now, it is the, um, the model subjected to a seismic signal. So at, at the upper image, you're going to see the excess for pressure is normalized between 0 and 1. So anything red is kind of totally liquidified. In the middle, you're going to see the shear strain, and then at the bottom, you're going to see the displacement. So this is, um, so uh, I forgot to mention this, but the, the real inspiration for this, for the client for paying off this, it was the buttress was super big. So this is the case without the buttress. So now you're going to see, oops. Oh. The video is not working. More technical issues, I guess. <coughs> OK, there's supposed to be a video here. I don't know how it's not working. I don't know why. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think it's up here. That's OK. Yeah, that's all good. Anyway, I have a simulation here where you would see the side of the signal. The excess port pressure is going to start developing at the top. Um, one more one. That's good. No. Uh, there we go. Thanks, Marcelo. Yeah. So, as you can see, as the signal, the dynamic signal is applied at the bottom, I mean, the, the tail is that this guy is the, I lost the pointer, but uh, this guy is here. They start to develop excess per pressure, and as, as soon as the excess per pressure softens enough, the soil, they start to develop some shear strain, and therefore, then later, it's the deformation. You can see also the deformation is controlled by the, the laser liquefy. So, this is, um, this is in real time, it's like a one minute uh, earthquake. I'm gonna just um, skip this part. I'm just gonna go to the final one. 
So at the, at the top, if, if this is a no buttress condition, at the middle is the buttress design, you can see fairly, this is the start down, the start down is here also. So this is the buttress design with a limited equilibrium, and then the buttress optimized by using flat uh, 3D in this case. It was a 2D section, but it was the still the environment was in flat 3D. Um, you can see obviously that the facility was not safe without buttress, and the facility was much, much better with the uh, buttress defined by the limited equilibrium. But after we optimized the buttress, we reduced the height because we understood the mechanism behind this, all the cinematic behind this. And actually, the, even at, at the top, it was even better. So and why is that? Because we allowed some deformation to happen. In this case, we were capturing the deformation. And this was anchoring the deformation to the base. So in this case, the client invested, say, about 350 to $400,000, and, but he saved $10 million by producing the battery. So the return investment was like 20 times. Uh, this, I don't know what was that. <laughs> so some closure. Um, I just want to say this is not related with my presentation. Those were flagship uh, for me cases. Uh, I really learned a lot from those. But I really want to kind of um, my, my thought on this. Uh, numerical model is not a tool, it's not a solution by itself. Uh, I've been, as I said, in both sides of the table, and sometimes people have told me, like, uh, this is what the model came in. Uh, that's really not an acceptable uh, answer. That's not something that we as engineers should take. It's a tool, it's like an Excel. Excel is not going to give you anything. It's, you put a wrong equation, it's going to give you something wrong. If you use a hammer to cut a piece of wood, is the hammer wrong or you are wrong? Basically, this is a tool, so use it properly. It requires a, a lot of key um, things, a lot of experience also. So, uh, if, if, you ever, if we ever work together, don't tell me that it was what the model gave me. It's not a black box. I mean, you can do a step-by-step cross-form solution. You can validate all the steps throughout the, the, the analysis. It doesn't have to go all the way from the beginning to the final report and say, this is what the model. There is a step in between you can do. Also, what I have experienced, uh, a lot, the mesh is usually overlooked, leading to not cost effective solutions. This has two faults. Sometimes uh, the, the mesh is not serving the purpose of the analysis. Numerical model is a tool, as I say, it's a simplification of reality. But the mesh has to serve the purpose. I mean, if you're studying cracking, for example, the cracks in development are all addressed, you're not going to have uh, elements with two meters. That's not going to give you the answer, right? But you don't need, like, a, I don't know, 20 centimeters element everywhere. You have to be optimizing. So, cost effective solutions. So also, for example, uh, this is very linked to the next one. Uh, I have experience with uh, a very brilliant geotechnical engineer said, I can do it. He has never done a 3D model in his life. He spent one year doing the numerical model. Just the mesh. So that's an extreme case. But ha that happens. That happens. So numerical model is threatened by non-qualified users, in my opinion. A lot of people said, oh, I'm a great geotechnical engineer. And I know a lot of them, but I think it requires a lot of experience, especially experience, knowledge, the tools and the hardware. Tools and hardware, we can buy it, right? Knowledge, pretty much all my colleagues have very good knowledge. But experience, I have been doing this for 13 years. The largest model I have done is 13 million elements, and I ran it. It didn't fail. It runs for eight days consecutively. But, but it's a very large model. So when somebody asks me to do something in 3D, uh, I have a lot of experience. I don't want to brag about this, but it requires experience. I sweat a lot. I sweat a lot of blood. I sweat a, a lot of this. This is my passion. So um, I, I learned how to do it properly. Apparently, not an added value. Some client says, this is an academic exercise. It doesn't have to be. Uh, we can produce the bread and butter. It's not everything like a, to that level they have done some project. Mm -hmm. It can be like a twenty thousand dollar analysis. It can be really, really like an initial concept. And um, if you're ever gonna hire somebody to do this, ask for information as much as possible. Ask for the portfolio. Have you done this before? Have you done something similar? If you're not, ask for the CVs. How are you gonna approach? Is the methodology? What, what are you planning to use? How are you gonna do it? Really, presentation. Ask, ask, ask. Because I mean, uh, I know there's many, many people right now using like a clicks, clicks here, click there. Especially with the current software, you can click a lot and you can get really colorful maps, but they're meaningless sometimes. Okay? So, with that, conclude my presentation.
Okay, yeah, no, so we do have some questions. Uh, sorry, some time for questions? Uh, yeah, so no, if you guys have any questions, my friend, please. Uh, Question here. Uh, I'm from ATC Wilan. Yeah, just would like to ask you normally for flag duty, how many elements do you think that is a reasonable to the standard model and to run the earthquake? How many elements normally? Oh, my rule of thumb is like if you go beyond 2 million elements, you're going to have a problem. Uh, because the time step is crucial in, in flight 3D. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, use a tool for making the mesh uh, compliance with some time step reasonable. And then beyond 2 million, million elements for dynamic, it's going to take some time. I mean, it, it can take like over a week. So, but, but 2 million elements is for rule of thumb. Thanks for the presentation. For the dynamic analysis that you mentioned, how you calibrate the damping, damping factor for? You don't. You don't. It's something that, it, that is embedded in the, in the, in the problem. You can minimize the, the over dumping, but you don't calibrate that. It's just, uh, you know, this theoretic loop is going to give you whatever it, it is built in the, in the model. So, yeah, new current models, like a boundary bounding type of models, they minimize that. They're not overshooting like before, like a, for example, uh, UC HIST, or UC, not sorry, UC HIST, UC SAN. UC SAN used to like, over dump everything. No, the current model is much better than that. Do you use also absorbing boundaries? To Sorry, you use also absorbing boundaries? For dynamic analysis? Yeah, yeah you have to use what is called free field and, and uh, uh, it's quite boundary. Yeah. Right. Although there's people that use fixed uh, boundaries, that's, that's tricky. Just adding a comment there. With respect to the mesh size and the dynamic analysis, you really need to be, it depends on the shear velocity, the, the minimum shear velocity of the material that we have there. And in order to have a proper wave propagation through the foundation, through the element, you need to minimize the size, otherwise you won't get a proper wave propagation. I agree with him, two meters, we, we sometimes get to one meter, depending on what you're modeling. So, yeah. And with massive modeling, it takes ages, especially with modern earthquakes. So. Yeah, that, that's absolutely true. And, and, and in addition to that, some people justify the models because they say, I've got the same PGA as the seismic hazard. And if you're using 0.5 meters, for example, naturally the model is going to filter out all the high frequencies. So PGA doesn't make any sense. Yeah. So, so there's a lot of things that you have to learn to do this properly. Yeah. Totally There's one last question. Then. In the first example, you had, um, you had a really strong peak response model and it was much more muted on what you measured in the field. Was that to do with geo properties, mesh size, precision model, what do you think that was? The, the, sorry, what, what, the peak? The, when you basically had the load, it was, in the model it was, it was a really high peak, but you saw a much more muted response in the measurement in the field. I, I think we saw both, I mean, we can go back. Uh, <coughs> you can tell me about this? Yes. So yeah, uh, in some cases it was the difference between the peak and the valley was quite significant, but in some cases it was very small. But the, the orange is the numerical model, so it basically was capturing uh, the, the shade in everywhere. So except when the instrument went wrong, like this one, for example. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Alfredo. <coughs> Okay, next we have Dr. Dr. Lee. Um, Dr. Lee has over 30 years of experience in numerical modeling in geotechnical engineering throughout his academic and consulting career. While completing his PhD research, he implemented constitutive models including a critical state soil model into a FINA, a finite element, model, element code, and optimized the code for high performance computing on a Cray supercomputer. He is a pioneer in using HPC for numerical modeling in geotechnical engineering. His consulting experience includes geotechnical, geoenvironmental, hydro, hydrological, geological, hydrogeological processes, and closure aspects of tailings and mine waste management. His experience in tailings was developed from working in projects in Australia, North and South America, Caribbean, Asia, and Europe with different climate and conditions. 
Dr. Lee has developed a series of theoretical models to model the tennis deposition, subaerial and subaqueous, and consolidation under self weight and desiccations under climatic conditions. Dr. Lee's work and theories developed have been published in leading international journals in the field and have been presented at Helens and Mind West conferences. Please welcome Dr. Lee. <laughs> of our advanced new work on uh, modeling for table stand safety management and what um, we can achieve use a numerical modeling technique. Before I start to uh, talk about numerical modeling for table stand, I want to present a couple slides to show you an example how the numerical modeling in the other industry. Um, this is an advertisement I took from the engineer Australia Create Maxine which shows the car uh, simulations and the um, you know, car crash simulations to use uh, finite M methods. The simulation can investigate what components of the car will fail during the car crash. And they also they can produce uh, the realization of the situation and from the driver's perspective. The numerical modeling also has been used uh, to investigate the potential uh, impact of the um, human bodies uh, using computational uh, models. This shows that how far the leg is going to stretch and then the, the impact pressure on, your, on the brain and the deformation of the abdominal areas in the case of the frontal crush. As we may know, the use of the numerical modeling to improve the car safety design uh, has been a routine practice for many decades. And numerical modeling is also very advanced in aerospace industry as well as uh, medical science. Compared to our colleagues in the manufacturing industry, um, who are really behind in this space. Uh, however, numerical modeling for geotechnical uh, engineering has uh, come a long way can use a, a symbolistic model to the uh, development of uh, advanced new, uh, constitutive model for nonlinear analysis. In this pre short presentation, I will uh, present a few aspects to use numerical modeling to improve uh, dam safety for tailings uh, management. First, I'll give a brief introduction of the technical challenges and the tools available and a touch on the limitation of the limited equilibrium analysis and followed by a brief discussion on the importance of uh, nonlinear numerical modeling. Then at the end I will give a few examples of uh, numerical modeling for static liquefaction and sensitive liquefaction uh, issues and as well as uh, some details on model calibration We often forget that tailings are not natural deposits like soil, which are given. Actually, we are cre creating the tailings deposits. We have the control if we know the physical process of the formation of the tailings deposits and the resulting um, properties. Here is a list of the physical process. In addition to your milling process and the process plan, which we don't have a control. But those uh, processes we do have control in some degree, um, such as the beach formation from tailings slurry as a non Newtonian flow, and the tailings large stream consolidation under self weight, tailings desiccation under climatic conditions, for, and the tailings aging with time due to chemical bonding, tailings creep with time if it's uh, resensitive. <coughs> Understanding the above pro uh, physical process will help us to understand in some tailings why have a brittle behavior under static and low conditions, as well as the understanding of the tailings behavior during the earthquake. <coughs> to uh, understand the 
parents, to prevent parents from failure, we also need to um, uh, understand the failure mechanism, including um, the failure mechanism under static loading conditions, such as a static liquefaction or strain softening, or progressive failure or foundation failure. Failure modes under seismic loading conditions, such as excessive uh, deformations or down failure due to liquefaction. There are tools available for design or operational maintenance time, including limited equilibrium methods and a physical modeling, such as large scale field testing or shaking tables or centrifuge testing. And the numerical modeling, such as uh, static uh, modeling or dynamic modeling. Uh, the nonlinear numerical modeling with uh, good geotechnical investigation remains the most powerful tool we have for land safety management. Here is a few aspects to explain why nonlinear numerical modeling is important. Taking stand stability is uh, crucial to ensure the safety uh, of the downstream community and the environment. The nonlinear numerical modeling is more robust than limited review analysis, and it allows us to simulate various failure scenarios and investigate different failure me mechanisms under different conditions. And it also helps us to identify potential mitigation measures and optimization of the design. It enables us to trigger established trigger levels for dam safety monitoring, including deformations, temperature, and ground acceleration monitoring. It enables us to assess embankment deformation to prevent loss of a freeboard during earthquake shaking. From the regulatory and the best practice perspective, as we know, most regulatory bodies require dam owner or operator to perform detailed stability assessments as part of the land safety regulations. And numerical modeling provide a rigorous approach to meet those uh, regulation requirements. From the cost perspective, conducting physical uh, testing on land tailing time can be very expensive and time consuming. Numerical modeling provides a cost effective alternative to investigate or to assess the that performance under different conditions. We often too much rely on the, on the limited equilibrium analysis without adequately addressing the limitation of the method we are using. Those limitations such as uh, the limited equilibrium uh, analysis does not allow for consideration of the string compatibility and there is limited application for complex uh, geometries and the com complex uh, variability of tailings properties. And it does not address progress failures. It does not address uh, dynamic effects due to earthquakes. It gives us uh, the shear stress along the steep surface, but doesn't know where the disease on the stress string curve. For example, if the stress sits on the right side of the curve in this figure, it's probably safe. But if it sits on the left, sorry, if it sits on the left side of the curve, it probably is safe. But if it sits on the right side of the curve, it will be unsafe. Detailed investigation of the high-profile tailings line failure in recent years has demonstrated the usefulness of the numerical modeling to investigate the, the failure mechanism of the tailings line, such as the flag modeling for fundamental tailings line by moving <coughs> And for the Brahmadipno tailings done by Robertson et al. And for Kelia tailings done by Jeffries et al. I don't want to get into the detail of those reports. I'm sure you all read them. But instead, I would draw your attention to a less well known report by CIMNE. No, CIMNE. For the investigation of the Brahmadipno tailings done failure. <coughs> From their investigation, I use the numerical modeling, and uh, they conclude that the overpressure to one of the boreholes for prosometer installation at the time, at this location, um, 
has um, caused local liquefaction. Then they liquefaction the local uh, li local liquefaction of the tail. Then the li liquefaction propagates uh, propagated among the strip surface, which uh, eventually trigger the overall failure of the of the tail stand of the embankment. This is a very interesting alternative explanation to this high-profile tennis line failure case. In the next few slides, I will discuss a few aspects in the static liquefaction water. Um, as we know, static liquefaction may sound a little bit uh, mysterious as it occurs uh, suddenly without precursor warning. But I would like to quote what Dr. Kim Bin said many years ago. Liquefaction of the soil is a well-documented phenomenon, frequently resulting in catastrophic failure and environmental damages, and financial losses, and deaths. What seems less well uh, appreciated is that the liquefaction is simply another constitutive behavior of the soil that can be understood in terms of uh, accepted physics and mechanics. The key point is that when you shear the soil into an arch strain, the end point is going to be on the critical state line, as shown in this state diagram on the right, in the void ratio versus log uh, effect of mean stress space. The soil, if the soil is above the critical state line, it's uh, contracted or have a brittle behavior. Soil significant below critical state line is a dilated or have a that kind of behavior given under engineering. There are many ways you can design the Timmins challenge against the static liquefaction failure. But this is the example of the design approach we propose to prevent static liquefaction failure of Timmins challenge. In, involving those uh, following steps, and I summarize in, uh, in this pro diagram on the right. In the one of the states is uh, advanced numerical modeling with the critical state approach and the more some constitutional model. In the numerical modeling, the first important step is to calibrate the constitutional model parameters. To calibrate more some parameters, we can carry out a series of track cell drain and anion drain test on reconstituted uh, samples. For this case, and we did it for both silty tailings and clay tailings. As uh, you can see from those figures uh, of the NAP test results, the critical state line for those tailings are well defined using a linear correlation. The Mosan uh, model can produce the results close to match the laboratory test results, as shown in this comparison of the model prediction to the tailings response um, doing an undrain track cell sharing in uh, respect to the stress path, stress strain curve, excess pulpature development. As you can see, the Mosan performed very well to describe the stream softening behavior of the tailings. The second step in the numerical modeling is uh, to establish an uh, elaborated numerical model. This shows an example of the flat model we, uh, we set up for an up upstream waste embankment with uh, refinements to account for the variability of the uh, things property in vertical and horizontal directions to reflect the field conditions. And typical numerical uh, modules uh, steps that will involve the simulation of the structural bank construction and the tailings deposition and the previous embankment races to set up the initial conditions. And then we can carry out the deformation analysis to model the construction of the proposed race or the batteries is applicable uh, or the future tailings deposition. The final step is to evaluate the results in terms of excess pressures, uh, shear stress or shear strains and deformations. This figure shows uh, the excess pressure response to, due to the uh, proposed release. As you can see, the maximum, maximum pressure uh, developed in the critical <coughs> zone, the location is far from the location of the embankment itself. Uh, this figure 
on the right, it shows uh, the stress redistribution due to the string softening of the soft tailings, where the upper stiff tailings taking uh, most uh, the shear stress to support the inactivities in the tailings deposition. The numerical model is also robust to, uh, in identification of the failure mechanism. Uh, this shows an example of a deformed mesh, exaggerated deformed mesh. You can see visually to see the stiff surface through the upper soft tailings as well as through the lower soft tailings layers. And it comes up naturally if you do doing any more analysis. There are a few points can be summarized on static refraction modeling. The stability of the tailings line due to potential static refraction can be assessed using a rigorous approach within the critical state soil mechanics framework. Well calibrated numerical model is a robust and important tool that can be used for land safety design and management. Thorough geotechnical geotech investigation and the tailings characterizations are important to provide input parameters for numerical models. In the next few slides, I will briefly talk about the nonlinear dynamic analysis and the in seismic design for tailings standards. Tailings characterization for the cyclical behavior of the material during the earthquake. It's the first most important step to, for the dam, long linear dynamic analysis. This shows uh, the cyclical resist, resistance of uh, a gold tailings and it determined from the uh, cyclical simple shear test in the laboratory. Uh, plot as a cyclical resistance versus the number of cycles to trigger spontaneous liquefaction. The upper curve was sort of from the test without static bias. The lower curve is uh, for the test from the static bias. As you can see, the static bias can significantly uh, reduce the cyclical resistance of the things. With the lab test results, we can calibrate the constitutional model. <coughs> this shows uh, the model, the use of the, this particular uh, constitutional model really can capture the onset of the liquefaction. <coughs> also produce uh, the results close to match this, the stress path and develop of the, uh, development of the excess temperature for this test at the CSR of uh, uh, 0.215. The numerical prediction can also carry out and for a, for a test at a higher stress ratio and it with the same star of 0.175. And use the same model of numbers was calibrated in the previous tests. As you can see from this from the stress string curve and stress paths and the excess pop pressure, the model produced excellent match to the laboratory test results. This really gives us the confidence of the capability of the constitutional model uh, can use for dynamic analysis actually capture the impact of this cyclic liquefaction on tailings time performance. As we all know, the performance of the embankment also depends on the, um, the characteristic of the ground motion from the earthquake, also the natural frequency of the embankment. Uh, for example, the shear wave well, may amplify when propagating through the embankment if the, the larger frequency of the embankment is uh, very close to the dominant frequency of the ground motion, as shown in this figure. And the plot, the ground um, spectrum response of the embankment crest in comparison to the spectrum of the ground motion of base. In this case, uh, amplifi amplification is over four times by in terms of spectrum acceleration. In evaluating of the dynamic analysis results or numerical results in general, and it is very important to really look at the, the deformation patterns, or say if that makes sense to you. Um, to understand the, how the system 
um, default, uh, default under seismic loading. In addition to, you want to get the, what the, the maximum sediment you will get given under a bridge. For example, um, this shows a deformation vector of the embankments, and then which is in um, Greece use a downstream con uh, construction method, and then but the last two races are center line race. Uh, as you can see, the center line race will suffer significant deformation towards upstream direction due to the liquefaction of the tailings under very strong earthquake. The shoulder of the embankment will have a deformation towards the downstream, and the base of the, embank uh, the embankment will mostly have a lateral spreading. Understanding the fit, uh, this uh, deformation pattern, we may uh, to optimize or, or change the design, really increase the seismic resilience of the embankment uh, in case of the high, the strong earthquake. For this case, we they propose for the downstream race instead of the upstream race, we put a arches at the at the top and then to confine uh, confine the the movements. A couple of points can be summarized based on above. The current available uh, constitutional model can realistically describe tenants, uh, behavior, uh liquefaction behavior of tenants, particularly in hard rock tenants during cyclical sharing. The nonlinear dynamic analysis is a powerful tool which can pre predict seismic deformation and a deformation pattern of the embankment under strong effects. Thank you very much. So you, you value it, uh, yeah, especially about future zones and uh, the deformation, the magnitude of the deformation will, will give a good insight how is how much it's going to have an impact on the future zone. If your future is wide enough, if you have an upper spreading of uh, three meters, but your future is only one meter width, you may not, you know, to uh, the, uh, after even the embankment is stable, but uh, you may have a uh, uh, have issues in your after earthquake, and uh, there, there are many indications. Okay, and they, in terms of the shear uh, string, the string patterns were also very important to look at. If you mostly, uh, if you have a uh, you know, large string give up, and uh, that's that's an indication of uh, your know, the stability of the embankment. I don't know if I answer all your. On your question, yeah. 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 So there's a, you look at the stress, stress and the deformation pattern. Very, that's a very good, uh, um, you know, to way to to see how uh, the impact will perform on the seismic events, and uh, and also look at the posture, how the posture is going to develop, because for most the uh, the the you know, the size in Australia you may not really ex expect a very much earthquake. So you may not complete the uh, things, may not may not liquefy, but however you may still develop excess temperature, uh, and uh, we you may have for uh, post construct uh, post earthquake uh, summaries. So something, yeah, but those will give you some insights, some useful results. What is the magnitude of shear strain? You think that we start worrying about it? I don't think it is a universal uh, for uh, for seismic uh, case. Um, it's uh, you might have well, you can have a, a tournament margin stream because uh, um, 
it's uh, it's a dynamic and um, you know it's uh, from the, it's not as um, uh, so during the earthquake the the pain uh, the uh, impacting of water yield most of the deformations come from the yielding of the so if you have a yielding you will have a larger strain uh, it's not like a static and then static case and if you're significantly yielding along the slip surface you know, wind, you may have a problem. Um, but the, for dynamic analysis, the strings, uh, normally during the earthquake, the strings are higher and they can tolerate um, uh, much uh, more uh, strain, shear strain. And, uh, but uh, it, it just means it's going to have a generally not more uh, deformations. It doesn't mean it's, it's, it's unstable. So there's a no universal actual strain. You can say this is a uh, the criteria, you know, this is in, uh, about 5% and uh, your dime is going to fail. Really, it's, it's kind of stable or not, they, uh, especially when you carry out the finite difference series of flat. And one of the advantages, the flat actually can tell you if the system is uh, stable or not. If it's not stable, and uh, they will convert into the kinetic, kinetic energy. And uh, they will try to get a solution. They can uh, accommodate a very large definition during the flag morning. Um, so the magnitude of the uh, of the definition really will tell you how you know, you have set the criteria 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 of the maximum definition the event you can tolerate, other than really a stability issue. Is it any material from ANCO or from to set up the maximum value of this from any variable that you Well, that's a that's, that's good comment. So, from uh, ANCO doesn't really give uh, those detailed prescriptive uh, yeah, requirements to the set uh, up well, the magnitude, the stream, or deformation. In fact, um, you, you had to, yeah, there's a lot of like a uh, rock fill of them part of the work, and they, and they, to talk about what the tolerance of the embankment and how much deformation you can tolerate. Can there, uh, if you look at that book or by rock and fill book, they give a list of the, the severity of the deformation and they, and they compare to to the size of the embankment. And, um, yeah, there's some some uh, probably in the in terms of cold and gap on. There's uh, still a lot of uh, area need to be developed more in details. Thank you. One question. Uh, what facility model do you use and how do you usually choose your facility model and make sure it's the best facility model you are going to <coughs> Yeah, that, that's a very good question. And the, the particularly, I mean, for that um, work we did, and uh, for the uh, uh, gold paints, uh, uh, upstream paint and stuff, yeah, we use the Unisan model. Um, and there's uh, quite a few uh, uh, your models uh, now, and uh, more newer, like the PIM for sun, the PIM for silk, and also develop. Um, for natural soil as well as uh, you know, tailings um, applications. It is uh, sometimes uh, um, it's, uh, it's a little bit personal cho uh, choice. We are reading all those papers. The, 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 the first thing you need, very important thing you need to look at is what model you should use. Has the, this model really a kind of really use a few cases? Have been validated. Use field cases. There's a lot of uh, technical resource in the public you know, literature. Has been used for uh, for other other uh, uh, projects. And uh, then, then the second, so you look at the uh, the the property of the tenants itself. The tenants have a broad range of the type. Some are more sandy. Like hard rock tailings, most of the sandy or silty tailings, but or silty was a very little plasticity. And then some of the tailings are like box tailings, 
or, or recent use, uh, it's very clean. So you might want to choose a complete, a very different uh, constituent model. So you consider the property of the tins um, and uh, the dynamic you know, um, behavior of the different materials. So there, I don't think that there is a, a particular say which model is better than um, the, this model is better than that, that model. They might give up for really different purposes. They will have for uh, pros and cons. I think the, the key is to really dig into it and to do all the research. And it's really is that where you need and you, yeah, that's really to be suitable for the material you're dealing with. Thank you. Uh, please join me to uh, thank uh, Dr. Lee. Okay, last but not least, uh, we have uh, Dr. Jeremiah Jad. Uh, Bruce is uh, ATC Williams Chief's, uh, Chief Technical Officer and has over 30 years of experience as a consultant researcher and educator in the civil geotechnical mining engineering fields with significant emphasis on geotechnical and water management aspects of tailings retaining structures. Dr. Jeremy Najad is also an honorary senior fellow at the Department of Infrastructure Engineering at the University of Melbourne. His research, his research expertise encompasses the application of a comprehensive range of experimental physical and theoretical modeling techniques in geomechanics. Berus has authored and co-authored numerous technical publications and lectures on the geotechnical engineering of environment dams. Uh, please uh, welcome Dr. General Man. Numerical techniques. I talk 
that they talk about critical earthquake loading and, and band geometry for analysis of seismic induced liquefaction and deformation. Just to provide an overall view of what needs to go into an earthquake induced liquefaction and deformation analysis. Essentially highlights you know, some of the issues and simplifications of the current analysis. So in terms of the concern, you know, the image is worth a thousand words. So what we are concerned about is the development of large movements or you know, and or cracks that could lead to uncontrolled release of water or pavements. And this is a photo from, from a dam in Chile that cracked as a result of seismically induced deformations. And any transverse crack connects to the dam stream side, off stream side, obviously a big problem you just have to be worried about. So when we're talking about seismic hazard, seismic deformation, we're not talking about only one aspect. You know, a lot of you know analysis are, are done. You know, we're looking at the, the first item about ground shaking. What does ground shaking do? That basically causes vibration in the hands, causes slumping, cracking. And, and, and it, it, it may result in liquefaction in the dam or in its foundation. But you need to also worry about the other three you know, seismic hazards for the sites when you're designing. One is fault movement in the dam foundation can easily cause a structural distortion. So if you get significant movement, then you can fail your dam. Fault displacement in, in the reservoir bottom can create tsunamis, which can overtop the dam and, and fail the dam. And, and the same with the rock, rock fall and mass movements as a result of the earthquake. Into the reservoir can again create species of water that will talk to them. In regions of high seismicity, usually the earthquake load is the, you know, the design load, the governing load for the, for the design of the dam. So what does ground shaking do? You know, it can cause sediment and cracking in the dam, as you can see, you know, schematically on, on this picture. So when the you know the earthquake load is bigger than the you know, resistance you know, uh, of, of the material, then with the first shaking you get the slumping and the upstream and downstream and then eventually slumping and reduction in the in the height of the dam. And possibly overtopping, possibly you know cracking it depending on where it is just uh, where the formations are. Or it could cause liquefaction as you know, discussed nicely you know, by uh, colleagues. And this is the cross section of the door San Fernando Dam, you know, we constructed from when all of these you know liquefaction assessments, seismic liquefaction assessments started, all of those studies by Seed and his co-workers. And that failed as a result of seismic liquefaction of that hydraulic field material and upstream shell of the dam see in this image. So there are some nice examples which I can, you know, more recent examples where I can show you that what vibration can do. So that dam, uh, was Palmer School Paving Dam, it failed in 2010 due to the earthquake in, in, in Chile, magnitude 8.8. .8. And uh, this dam was interestingly close at the time. That operated between 19, 1980s to 1997. Um, and the surface was covered by, you know, as you can see in this image after the failure, covered by, by 15 centimeters of, of, of a clay material uh, as a cover. And you can see a lot of material is dry. You have a very nice crust at the top of the tailings. But we shouldn't be fooled by this, you know, the, the, depending on the strength of the earthquake and if the, you have tailing saturated. This, this was an upstream raised there at the lower level, resulted in liquefaction. And as you can see, it's the signs of you know, sand balls, if you're worried, you're seeing the liquefaction. So sand ball is, is definitely a sign for seismic liquefaction. You must have seen this a lot in, 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 the, in the news for the earthquake in, in Christchurch and a lot of you know, sand balls up and around the, around the camp and um, clearly you know, showing the red that can pay this move. You know, this move is about 500 meters down from some of the dam. So that dam, that's Fujinomo Dam failure, 
according to 2011 to 2012, which was about 200k away from these two dams. These were constructed in, uh, you know, post World War II, 1940s, around that time. And 200k away, magnitude 9, resulted in the failure of these two dams. And there were, you know, earthfield you know, embankments fully lined. But assume that the, the, the web has traveled 200 k to, to get to this point and resulted in, in cracking and, and, and also uh, failure of these dams. So the failure has been blamed to you know, cracking and differential settlement and parking there eventually, as you can see. This much. Fault in the foundation of the dam. That's one of the you know, hazards that we need to be looking into when we're looking at the zone of embankment that in, in the regions of high It can result in a structural distortion. This, this dam failed in 1999 due to the earthquake and the trust fault in the, in the foundation of the dam. Right fault similarly can do that. This is not due to the earthquake, but the landslide to that water story downstream. That's Paul Branco Dam which was on the downstream side of a, a glacier dump behind it. And due to heavy rainfall, that resulted in you know, the, the slide into the abandoned area as a result of the top of the dam. But because the storage was too small, uh, it didn't really fail the actual dam. But it's, this is one of the things that we do when we're designing the dam for us, where we get all around the abandoned, making sure that there are not any places that they can sliding into the dam, and if there are, we need to be stable. So what we do usually to work out the load, the earthquake load at the site, just do seismic hazard assessment, site specific sites, you know, seismic hazard analysis, either probabilistic or you know, deterministic, to establish the seismic load at where the, the structure is. So, but depending on the source of the earthquake, you may just draw a radius of like 200k around the, where your site is and, and locate all of those historical <coughs> earthquakes, faults, everything, to be able to integrate all of that to find out what the hazard is at the site. And how that the wave travels through the ground, it, it, it depends on the, you know, that there are so many attenuation functions and things like that that they use to work at what would be the site of hazard at the site. I've been moving quickly in this. So for any earthquake, it can be characterized by you know, three parameters, <coughs> amplitude, frequency, and duration. Uh, PGAs, peak ground acceleration, peak ground you know, velocity, and peak ground displacement are the amplitude parameters. So we get a lot of earthquakes with you know, PGAs of like one, but they mean nothing because they're pretty high frequency. They have very really low effect. In so you get a lot of that. That's why when we're looking at the earthquakes, we don't really get the, you know, those high frequency you know, motions. And frequency content is, is very important. And de deriving you know, from your a spectrum, it can tell you of what sort of frequency content that you have in your earthquake. It gives you a bit of better idea of what the earthquake is, is made of. And, and duration is pretty important, but if you do it, you know, response spectrum for the site includes all of these three elements. And in, in terms of when we're saying the response spectrum is essentially the maximum response of a single degree of freedom structure. So imagine with different, you know, frequency, natural frequencies to the, to the, same, to the same earthquake motion. So say that we have different, you know, uh, single degree of you know, freedom of structures, oscillators in simple term, a spring with a mass on the top. Okay? They all have different natural frequencies. You apply the same you know, uh, earthquake or you know, motion to it, and the maximum, the peak value that you get from each of those, it defines what we call the response spectrum. It is very really important, this one, because it gives you a lot of things, you know, that at what frequency you get in you know, access you know, more amplification compared to others. So 
Earthquakes are usually provided in, in the form of acceleration time histories like this. And in this case, as, as you can see, the acceleration is about 6 meters per square second, or about point G. If you draw a Fourier amplitude spectrum, well, this is Fourier power spectrum, doesn't matter, you can see the frequency content. You can see there is no energy you know, beyond 12 turning net with this you know, Alfredo set that we filter high frequencies to make the mesh smaller. So you, you can see what are the, you know, the frequency content and, and where you get the maximum you know, amplitude, it is, it, is, it is called dominant frequency, but that doesn't mean anything. Earthquake is not a single you know, point, it's all of us which have different frequencies. And, and depending how they line up with the natural frequency of your structure, they're going to cause <coughs> amplification, the amplification. <coughs> it is also important for you to, you know, to understand that there are different magnitude scales used historically and currently. Something to be mindful of when collecting and using the data. So you got Richter, you know, magnitude which goes to about 6.5. We got moment magnitude which is more recent, and everything now converted to moment magnitude when you take them the seismic. You know, as an analysis. So again, when you look using the you know, input load, you, you just have to be mindful of what magnitude you're using. And when a probabilistic seismic hazard assessment is carried out for, for a site, uniform hazard spectra uh, are usually the load that you can see here for different return periods or different annual exceedance probability, as you can see from ranging here from 200 to about 30,000 years return period. Usually the value that you read of, you know, a uh, very small period was close to zero period. That's your big ground acceleration you can see there. And that's your responsibility, as I discussed earlier and explained how the site, you know, how response is made to it. So there are things which I'd like to share with you here. And, and because ANCOR guidelines know it, I mean, when you read the earthquake guidelines of ANCOR, it recommends you to use a conditional mean spectrum. And in that, it means that the response spectrum is conditioned around the natural frequency, which is assigned to the natural, they indicate as a natural frequency of the structure. Well, Uniform hazardous spectrum covers the full range of frequencies for a site. Okay? It is conservative, yes, but do we have any other way? No. Why? Because the natural period of embankment or any other structure depends on the height and the shear wave velocity of, 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 of the material. So is the height of the tailings then constant? No. It's moving you know, over the life of the facility. And it's not the same even for water dam because we've got a valley. Some areas are just much shorter compared to the you know, deepest section. Is the shear wave velocity of the materials are the same constant? No, they're not. Shear wave velocity is directly calculated from the you know, stiffness or modulus of the material. Right? And we know that shear wave velocity increases with confining stresses, but that's not constant either. So in, in the right hand picture, you can see that on vertical is basically a spectral acceleration versus the period or frequency, which is one over period. And the black line there shows you the uniform hazard response spectrum. And these are the conditional mean spectrum with different you know, frequencies. And you can see it all sitting well below that. So that's why we recommend not using the conditional mean spectrum for your design. How, you, how this is you know, used in the design is time histories are produced from the response spectrum that you've seen in the previous pages for your design earthquake. For example, if you have a 10,000 year return period for your design earthquake, use the spectrum for the 10,000 year return period of 1 in 10,000 and it's in probability. 
there are two methods to work at your you know, time speed. Uh, acceleration time speed or velocity or displacement time speed. One is called the spectral matching. And one method is a, spe a spectral you know, scaling. And this method so they, they look at, you know, seismologists, I'm not a seismologist, I learned all of this from our internal seismologists in our, in our company. So they look at the catalog, earthquake catalog, work out the responses spectrum for so many earthquakes, the one which are closer to the shape of this, okay? And then they come and match it, factor it with different factors at different points to get a close fit like that. Also, with the scaling, if this is your design spectrum, they only scale it up to a point, only one constant you know, factor, the scaling it up, which is at the natural frequency of the structure. Supposedly, as I explained, that's not uh, one number. And you can see you can't really get you know, a close fit. But the good thing about this part is that these are actual earthquakes. No changes in the characteristics of the earthquake phases or whatever. And this one, although we get a very good close fit, the actual earthquake is pretty much distorted. You know, the things happening at different timing. But the load is there. Our recommendation is pretty much using the spectral matching for the, for the purpose of the work that we do in Australia because the earthquake loads are pretty small anyway in general. And, and matching, it gives you. Uh, the option of having less earthquake analyzed, especially if you have a big month. You have your time history now, you see how much uncertainty could go into what has been produced at this time. Now, you need that to, what that produced is, is drop after motion. That time history is out at that point. That's what the seismologists produce for you. What you really need to put into your numerical model is, is what is to go, the base of this. What you need in your liquefaction assessment or the formation analysis is, is the acceleration profile within this deposit or the surface, you know, if you're using one of those conventional methods for liquefaction assessment. Which none of this is the same as that. So if you get the PGA out of this and apply it to your model, then it, it, it's not true because that can you know, amplify to get to that point, can de-amplify. What you measured here is not the same as that. That's why this needs to be deconvoluted to get that notion there. And then propagate it through the profile to get the acceleration at the top of the head. I have a nice program here to share with you and hopefully it works. To clearly example, to clearly show that what we mean here. This program has been developed by Professor Ar Arnold Brut at Delft University, he passed away last year. A pretty small program. Okay? It's a program to determine the response of a linear elastic soil layer. Uh, we we disturbed the damping to a harmonic based motion. So, what you really need for that, let me just use my. Is this working? Or? What it requires is, is the period of that harmonic uh, input motion, which means the constant in the period. And the thickness of the soil layer is, is H. And 
C is the shared velocity of, of the material, the soil. Zeta is, is the soil damping. And B is the equivalent in you know, a depth of you know, soil for a certain load, which we're not going to use that anyway here. This is the formula to calculate the natural frequency, the fundamental frequency of, or fundamental period of a rectangular profile or a uh, horizontally spread <coughs> But I just want to run this program for you, but let me see if I can get much luck with this. This is the depth of the soil profile, normalized with the total depth. Okay, so that's why the top is one, bottom is zero. So if I put like 0.4 in the, in the period of the input motion here, and keeping that uh, the thickness of the soil to be 20 meters, and if I start increasing this, so this is dark. So this computer has a different setting than that one. The damping is 1% less. Apply no loading uh, at the surface. So you can see that you, you don't get much amplification. It's best basically you're starting you know, from one to one and you get no amplification. You can see that here we're getting only one. So let's get this closer to you know to resonation. Using that relationship, we know that if we just multiply you know four by uh, height of this, which is 80, and in order to get this to be 0.4, you know, to be equal to the period of the input motion. You have to make this to be 200. But let's let's just start with you know raising it with uh, uh, 50, and then you can see you get a bit of amplification there. Right? And let's make it to be 200. I didn't change the damping. I just kept it at one percent. Then you can see that they just you get some significant amplification through here because you resonate. But this is all related to the height and what you do with your earthquake compared to the material. But you, you can you can do all sorts of things with this. You know, 200 meters per second is it, it's pretty normal for you know for tailing. <coughs> if you go with the with the material which you know pretty let's get to it again to 100. We can easily damp this if we just go with the damping. 5% damping can reduce it. We can damp this you know, as much as we want. If we make this to be very steep, make this to be 500. I should have used my own computer. <laughs> The mass doesn't work. That's, ah, yeah. I just want to so essentially saying this material is very steep. It's just whatever that you apply the bag, it, it, it just applies to the top. So all I'm just trying to present here is that this is just the loading part of the size of the analysis. Imagine the number of uncertainties you're putting into this part. From seismic analysis to the convolution of the load, 
the way we're just putting it into place and, and what it can happen. But going back to where we were, I don't want to just spend more time on this, but that's to show you that how the, you know, the period of the, you know, this is just for horizontal, you know, a rectangular shape material. When we go to triangular shape, different relationships should be used, okay? And our, this is only for the first, you know, this is for the fundamental period, and for the first mode of vibration, okay? So, so much into this. And, and if you want to do it properly for, for a material, then, then you just have to, for, for a soil, then you, you should know that the modulus of the soil, that the soil behavior is non-linear. The modulus shear and velocity changes with the shear strain. So during the earthquake, even the period is changing. So if you, can, you can use this method, which is, you know, devised by you know, like this in C to do that the simplified analysis and work at the, the first three natural periods of, of and in fact, the triangular shape of that. So, when you're selecting the critical embankment section for stability and seismic analysis, this is important. So obviously, you use the, you select the maximum height because your stresses are pretty really high. So the height you adding to the stresses. Always you select the sections with unfavorable foundation conditions or if you have problems in the embankment material or zoning or whatever cracking. That's what you have to always use that section. The other section that you need to be analyzing, based on what I explained to you, you know, with the quack program and, and how you know the frequency content of the earthquake compared to the frequent, natural frequency of that section, it can cause amplification. You may get more deformation in the section which is shorter than the one which is you know, totally a single. And you need to be finding this out before you're just jumping into full numerical analysis of that. So this is a pretty you know, uh, simple example, one of the work that I, one of the early works that I've done in 2004. For a dam which was about 180 meters in the side of the region. And, and we've done several you know, sensitivities using software shape. We have software you can do you know, response analysis for software very simply. And using you know, Matthewsian seed to, to work out what gives us the maximum deformation, what gives us the maximum you know, press acceleration. And in order, to, and we've done that with very simple, very simple uh, analysis. So looking at different earthquakes, embankment height ranging, you know, this is a tailings down to start at 70 meters high the start of embankment and getting to 180 meters in the mine life. You would think okay, 180 meters is gonna give me the maximum <coughs> maximum deformation, maximum acceleration. No, that's not true. Compared with, with where you, you're getting that, you know, the maximum displacement. This is one way of just finding out which section that you need to be analyzed with geometry if you're doing it to the analysis. So this is other recommendation I'm almost finished. And so the uniform hazard response spectrum, you know, they the usually power full range, so we just highly recommend them. Uh, because they just although they're providing an upper band, I think it should be used. And I believe that ankle guideline needs to be modified because the demand what is you know indicated in the research. In terms of spectral matching or scaling, they may be effectively used either way. Uh, we have spectral matching for areas of both seismicity like Australia. And dynamic response analysis is definitely a must for any site that you're going to because you don't know the depth of the soil thickness. What you're getting from the seismology is the, is the rock output. And you need to be turning that into the uh, shear stress profile or acceleration profile within the within the deposit or within the dam. And you can simply use some you know simplify you know, dynamic analysis as a precursor to effectively identify the most critical and back and parts for liquid fashion analysis or for more complex companies 
the formation analysis, which is like that's all. Uh, Thank you. We have time for one quick question before our last presenter. Yeah, we're so tired. Well, I've got a question. Yes, please. Now, in general, we analyze simple earthquakes. Um, what about the Rayleigh and Love wave type earthquakes that sort of roll through and actually does not have a vertical displacement, but a vertical displacement? How's that cope with in seismic analysis? In seismic analysis, mm -hmm. uh, it's a, if you do 2D or 3D analysis, you get waves in three directions. You can always analyze all three. But in terms of what you do in the simple analysis, like that, you only look at one, for example, displacement. And the belief out there is that all the vertical you know, uh, movements are just getting vertical, uh, vertical direction waves all get attenuated very fast. So they all say that horizontal is what you need to be worried about. Mm -hmm. At least we're in back okay? I'm not talking about, you know, Structures with, with high national frequencies. Is it uh, the uniform um, response spectrum will give you a more consulting outcome than the. In terms of the earthquake group, yes. I think that's what you. That's the question. It gives you more concern. Upper band. Because it just integrates all of those seismic hazards for a site and, and, and all natural frequencies and everything. That's why it just provides an upper band. Some people say that's too conservative, I'm not going to use that. Maybe that's a way for some sites, you know, when you're looking at high seismic in the area. Uh, I don't know what you worry about in Australia. We don't have high earthquakes here. Okay, thank you very much. Drinks you have tonight were for free, so you can pay for them. Uh, so please uh, welcome Dr. Nate Harris. Uh, he's the director of Hexagon Mind Monitoring with over 20 years of experience. Uh, and today he wants to demonstrate the new slow deformation of the that they have developed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. slides. I have to say, I, I saw those presentations and I had some flashbacks, like about 20 years ago I did a lot of FLAC, um, UDEC, FLAXIS, and Abacus modeling, and I have to say that I'm glad I'm not only a modeler, it was a fantastic four years experience, but leave it to the professionals. What I would say for actually for all the, the younger geotech engineers, you should do some fun out of the model, because if it comes to mesh dependency, constituent models, doing models where you're looking at fluid flow as well as deformation, have a go at it. Make sure it gets reviewed by professionals, but it's really important for you young engineers to learn how to do this stuff so that you can then at least critique the professional work. So even though I guess people pay for the work I did compared to some of the numerical stuff I've seen just then, I'm glad that I'm not any more of a model. I mean, this is something different. Um, so I went into, I guess, really displacement monitoring and looking at real things in, in many respects. And it was just an opportunity, so I've just got a couple of slides. So in a couple of months' time, we've been working a lot on something we call um, SMV, so it's a, a slow movement analysis of, of radar data for specifically designed for tailings now. So we've got a couple of dozen radars monitoring tailings dams 24 hours a day at the moment in different parts of the world, and in particular, not so much in Australia specific, but in particular in Brazil, um, there's a lot of real-time monitoring happening by our company. And they're interested in mines in that the, um, for the guys who've been there, or girls who've been there, you'll see there's a lot of vegetation on, on the surface. And vegetation typically for radar and for LIDAR um, is a very reflective surface. 
So you get a lot of noise when you have like vegetation on the surface. So there's a lot of work done over the last year, basically, how do we deal with that fact that in a lot of parts of the world, you've got relatively high rainfall, which causes problems for building tenant dams, particularly, I guess, upstream tenant dams, but also afterwards, after the fact, you often have vegetation growing on tenant dams, which gives you a problem for monitoring. So typically, most of the work that I work on is in open pits, and it's in real time, so I look after fast, very fast, extremely fast. So I, I'm typically picking up rapid drill failures for open pit metaphors mines. For tailing stamps, some of the things they're looking for is very small, one millimeter per month type displacements, which typically in the past hasn't been a sweet spot for either light or radar. So this approach is basically a way that um, you process the data. So the benefit of radar is that because you're scanning all the tailing dam every basically two minutes, you get lots of data and it gives you a lot of ability to process that data, stack noisy together, and basically, if there is noise as to vegetation, you throw it away and basically you still have plenty of data to get to the problem. So again, very quickly, so the picture on the left is the typical radar data you will get for a tailor stand. So you've got, in the bigger points are prisms, and then in the smaller points are the radar data, uh, part of my French is mainly just noisy shit. So that's because there's vegetation. You just, and this would be whether you're using LiDAR or radar. <coughs> if there's vegetation on the surface of a dam, you're just going to get noise. Yeah. Um, where you get the benefit from this process, which will be released in a couple of months' time, again, mainly working on vegetated dams in Brazil, is this, this Guardian SMV approach where they can process the data. And you can see the middle one is the radar data. So. Uh, if I would put it back to um, numerical models, so this is giving you real-time data to calibrate those models. So obviously, we're talking about surface deformation, so we can't tell you what's happening inside, and that's always a downfall for all these surface measurements, but it gives you a good start in terms of seeing some of the structure. So again, this is some real data. If you look at um, some of the prisms they picked at the, the toe of the tailors down, you've got the, the blue is the noise in, in prisms, and that's the kind of noise you will get with prisms because you've got an atmospheric factor affecting the, the speed of light due to mainly moisture content, and so you naturally will get prism noise. The red is the old radar monitoring, which is if you bought a radar from me today for a pit, that's what we would use. And this green is this, this new approach, so we get far better, I guess, matches to what we're seeing with prisons. And at the moment, a combination of GNSS monitoring, so satellite uh, GPS monitoring, and prisms are really the de facto sort of standards we're using to calibrate it. And that's really it. I've got one last slide, and um, this is really my idea of what I've seen with radar monitoring. As I said, we do have a couple of dozen radar monitoring real-time uh, tailor stamps in the world. There's none that we are currently doing in my group in, in Australia or Asia Pacific. Um, and, but that's not saying that we don't do monitoring. We do monitoring using tilt meters, with prism meters, and with uh, GNSS. So I think um, there is a role for radar, and if everybody, anybody has the budget, I, as a businessman, I'm happy to sell you radars because they're very expensive. But as a geotech engineer, because I'm a geotech engineer, I think in most applications for tailings down, particularly in Australia, if it's dry and a well-designed tailings down, you probably don't need radar. Where I think radar has its role is when there's operational wheels and monitoring critical hazards, so that's probably some of the stuff we've seen in Brazil. Um, monitoring due to failure, recovery, or lift development, so we have done some monitoring in Australia where there's been a failure, and they've wanted a radar to basically monitor the, I guess, the rehabilitation of that failure to make sure it's safe for the guys working under that failure. Um, lift development, so the next lift, again, because you can, you're can measuring in real time every couple of minutes what's happening, it gives the geotech engineers on site some level of confidence that they know what's going on. Monitoring during uh, high, high access and high critical risk, so we've done this where, I guess, through the engine record, you guys who do that work, where you realize that some of the design principles perhaps were a bit flawed and there's actually big slimes layer or some, some low friction strip layers, and they've got to go onto the tailings dam to do some site investigation. Because they're concerned, they wanted a degree of confidence of having some real-time 
risk management with some radar monitoring to basically make sure that they're safe for that period of a couple of weeks while they're doing this investigation. And um, the last one I'd say is auditing or identifying hazards and hazards. Again, because radars are measuring every couple of minutes, in a couple of days you will pick up a good idea of what actually is moving. And it might be that because the cost is too prohibitive to have a real-time radar there, although in some situations it, it makes sense, but from a couple of days of monitoring, it will tell you where your hazards are, what's moving, and then you might do standard tilt meters or, or prisms or lower cost options, or even just identify those are the areas of the tail exam that you are getting movements today, and when you guys are doing their site investigations, the engineering records, that's the places where they move their measurements. And take their photographs. And it's been a long evening, I think that's it. Thank you. <laughs>
and they called us up and basically they wanted help to recover the body. And we basically just flew up the system and basically it was running within the first two hours. So we just got a site. We said we haven't got time to, to fly one up with power because we have some power options. They provided a lightning plant, we plugged it in and basically started monitoring and got some lightning data after about two or three hours. But as I said, as a geotech engineer, I see a lot of tail end stamps, particularly in Australia, because they're well made and, and more importantly, it's a very dry place. Radars are not used. That's my, I said, as a business one, I'll say radar, but I think in most situations, radars are not needed in Australia. The other, the other thing about failing then, is they, they're moving. They, they move a lot, you know, they, they perform, especially the upstream radars. So which are not really the sign of the failure, it's just basically the natural, you know. Uh, yeah, and, 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 and that's why this, you know, radar. And what you find with, and it's, it's the same with all the pits, which I've worked on this stuff for 20 years now. Mm -hmm. um, all of it's moving. If, I, if I'm monitoring a low or a coal mine, that's going to set up three or four meters. Everything's moving, it's all dynamic. The issue is, what is moving more than the back, the rest of the stuff? So what is, where is the incipient failure? So part of the reason why we is so successful is that we'll pick up a a red blob, which is accelerating quicker than the rest of the background. But there's always a degree of background movement. And part of the challenge is to get really good information for the numerical modeler people is they really want to have the displacements from day zero or from time zero and pick it up over time. Whereas often if we come in at the very last minute because the customer seemed cracking, We've missed all that peak, peak, peak stress event, and it's already failed. It's still useful as an operational tool, but quite often we'll miss all that input that the new model models have used because we, we haven't picked the beginning of it. Yes? Uh, the coding tool you have experience, what's the Um, I, I got some good funding from ACOMS, looking at a lot of data from the previous radio company, Ground Group, because I was the first geotech engineer for them, and it's a hard thing to say, but there's no obvious answer. And it really, for a start, particularly when I talk to civil engineers, it depends on what you class as, as fair. So for me, as more of a rock character mining guy, I'm looking for a collapse and stuff falls on the floor and potentially people get killed. But if it's functional failure where you whole load it, you move to a point where it can't be used or you're starting to basically, if it's got uh, electric um, shovels and you're damaging cables, then a slow linear failure, so actually a displacement is important. But most of the time in most minor situations, displacement doesn't really matter. And the really peak thing we see is acceleration or changes in velocity. But obviously, the, the, the moment you go to acceleration, you deal with more noise problems. So typically, more reliable, most of the alarms that people set around the world that I've worked with, they tend to be What's the time span? What's the time step between the um, The time step between, so the scan times, uh, varies as a number of different technologies from about one and a half minutes to about three minutes. Um, typically, because there is still atmospheric noise there, um, tight alarm settings, and this is more for uh, open pits, will be, they'll look at displacement thresholds over about two hours, sometimes an hour, and when they're looking at really relatively tight rock, rapid brittle rock failure, again, it's sort of rock, so, and this will be small, tend to be single beds or double bed failures, they will be looking at something about two or three millimeters. So if, it, if that, that bench has moved two or three millimeters in a couple of hours, that tends to be enough warning to basically say that things going to collapse. Now again, every mine is different. I look at some of the iron ore miners we work with, and we provide 24-7 monitoring. So we've got geotech engineers in Indonesia who are looking at the screens all the time and reviewing this data. And they have lots of single bench failures, but they don't care. That's probably the right word. It doesn't concern them because they've got wide enough benches that they all get caught. So no material ends up down in where the working environment is. So again, 
particularly the guys from a civil background, you know, the idea that you, you, you design benches for factory safety in 0.95 because they should fail. You know, if your benches don't fail, then you've been far too conservative and you've lost a lot of money. So, failure is okay, and that's where it's certainly a minor open pit mechanics. I'm saying most of the tail down failure is probably not okay. But a bench scale failure, failure is fine and you should embrace it. It's how do you manage that? And this isn't the answer, but it's one of the tools that helps develop it. Okay, guys, before you leave, I would like to thank you all for attending. And I really do apologize for all the technical issues. It was <laughs> really out of my hand that I couldn't do you know, more about it. And I would like to thank our sponsors for the generous support and also a special thank you to our presenters. Uh, they took the time and, you know, Alfredo, for example, flew from Paris and Beirut flew from Melbourne to just, you know, come tonight and present for us. Just um, yeah, put your hand together for them. Thank you for organizing. She organized these events and producing her own time. So yeah, please thank you for that. Uh, there are some <laughs>